Hello everybody. As a British petrol head, there are certain cars I am legally required to despise. Some for good reason, others because Jeremy Clarkson said so, and then there's a few that on principle go against all that is natural and right. This includes the likes of the Range Rover Evoque convertible, the Audi TT diesel, and of course this, the Mini Paceman. And for those who have maybe heard of the Paceman before, but can't quite remember which one it is, this is essentially the three-door variant of the Mini Countryman, their attempt at building an SUV. And I do have a little bit of sympathy with Mini, because the fact is, the Mini started as a car, and now it's a brand. So, like with the Fiat 500, to try and build anything that isn't exactly like the first does seem like a little bit of heresy. However, today I am doing that most entertaining of things and facing my automotive prejudices to find out whether the Mini Paceman really deserves the hate. <laughs> Today's video persuades you to head to the classifieds in search of your Mini, be it classic, modern, or something a little bit unusual, then make sure to use Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases from around the globe to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase, including previous accident damage, mileage discrepancies, usage as a taxi, fire, theft, and outstanding finance. A Car Vertical search takes just 60 seconds and can be done either on desktop or with their mobile app. For 10% off the service, don't forget to use my discount code JM. Now, speaking of facing things head on, <laughs> just around this bend, you will see the evidence of something along those lines because uh, there used to be a lamppost there. And now there's the remains of a lamppost, which has been sheared in half by a voxel. That had to be a hell of a hit. Ooh, gotta be careful on these roads, they are a little bit damp and greasy. But at least I do have four-wheel drive. And I suppose that is the first point in this car's favour, because while many of us mock it for trying to be the SUV that it clearly isn't, it at least does have the decency to offer customers an all-wheel drive option which this model is equipped with. More specifically, what we have here today is the Mini Paceman John Cooper Works All 4. In other words, the highest performance variant that was available, making just shy of 230 horsepower from its notoriously unreliable 1.6 litre BMW slash Peugeot engine. This is the one that your parents warned you about. Thus far, it has been good to its current owner, James, but he is very aware of its reputation and so is making sure to keep servicing it ahead of schedule. As it happens, this is not just his third Mini, but also his third car. He learned to drive fairly late on, when he was bequeathed a Mini Clubman, courtesy of his late uncle. That, in case you're wondering, is the sort of estate-shaped one with the weird little half-door over here. Having really fallen for that car, but deciding he wanted something just a little bit sportier, it was then joined by an R53 Cooper S. That's the first generation car with the supercharged engine that is an absolute riot to drive, but unfortunately these days are all falling apart. And that is exactly what happened to his, having paid a thousand pounds for it, then 500 pounds for tires, he actually eventually wound up giving it away, because I think he felt bad asking anybody for money for it. The Clubman, he wound up partexing for this because he decided he wanted to combine the two cars into one and so have something that was on the one hand sporty but on the other also a little more practical. But because he doesn't really use the back seats all that much, he opted for the Paceman as opposed to the slightly more logical Countryman, which conveniently I'm just about to pass an early example of. Doesn't look anywhere near as stylish as this, I must admit. The rear lights in particular are very different between the two and this, as a model in of itself, I don't think it's actually a hideous looking thing. Like most Brits, I think the issue I have is the fact they've put a mini badge on it. I mean, what choice did they have? But sadly for them, it says mini. And these aren't. Certain people, cruelly, call them a maxi. The 
the Paceman was always a fairly odd duck, and it would appear that even BMW themselves struggled to understand exactly what the Paceman's place in the lineup was, and so for that reason, it became one of the shortest lived of all Mini variants, having a production run that went only from 2012 to 2016, when the Countryman, on which it was based, went into its second generation, and this was simply discontinued. But perhaps most shockingly of all, where the vast majority of the current Mini lineup is still produced in Britain, this and the Countryman were not, instead being assembled over in Austria by Magnus Steyr, who, to be entirely fair, do rather know what they're doing. And in case you haven't heard the name, they are, I suppose you would call them, a coach builder that have produced cars for a great number of other brands. From Aston Martin, they built the first gen Rapide, to Mercedes Benz, they built and build the G Wagon, and even the likes of Peugeot, because they put the RCZ together there. Even, I seem to recall, the European variants of the Chrysler 300C were built there. And their decades of experience making cars for a number of different OEMs really does shine through. Despite the fact the second generation Mini wasn't quite as flimsy as the first, today many of them are falling apart. This though still feels fairly well put together, although it hasn't been an entirely happy ownership experience for James. He picked it up from a Mini main dealer. Not long into his ownership, the clutch pedal just sort of went to the floor and took a little bit of time before it returned. Not being able to repeat the problem, he wasn't really sure what to do. However, a few months later, it came back, and then it stayed on the floor. The clutch and flywheel had both gone, but the main dealer didn't really want to take any responsibility because, as far as they were concerned, he'd waited too long to report the issue, and that's a wear and tear item. £2,600 later, and the car now has fresh flywheel and clutch. Humorously, well, for me anyway, he says that not long after this, he then found in the glove box a pass certificate for a driving test. An automatic driving test. Just in case you weren't aware, here in Britain, if you pass your test in an auto, you're not actually allowed to drive a manual. Subsequently, he has also replaced the discs and pads. That cost another £1,000. One of the issues with these cars being essentially a division of BMW is they price their parts like a BMW. But modern day minis being a little bit more expensive than everyone expects them isn't really news. Instead, what has kept them really in the public consciousness for the last 20 years is just how good they are to drive. And so, does this car have a little bit of that mini magic? Well, with the rain beginning to fall, I suppose it's time I found out. You know something? It actually does. It's a very keen thing, this. That, to me, is a big element of the Mini driving experience, a really pointy front end. And this has it, to a surprising degree, I must admit. More than that, though, I'm actually really impressed with the ride quality of this car. Most of the modern sporty Minis, and even some of the less sporting ones, though they have been fun, their Achilles heel to me has been the fact they're just a bit too firm in some cases being quite crashy, and that really is a shame. This though, maybe because it's designed to be as much SUV as hatchback, seems to be a, a little more compliant. It's not the quickest thing out there, it will eventually get to about 60 mile an hour, but from then it seems to struggle. The 230 horsepower of the engine being blunted by the one and a half tons it has to carry around. I think the fact that the power does come in fairly smoothly, it's sort of two and a bit thousand RPM, it doesn't throw you back in the seat, it likely helps with the traction. It just doesn't throw you forwards like the really spicy Minis would. In fact, the last car I drove from Mini was a new generation three-door Cooper S, and that had about 180 horsepower, yet felt quite a bit more rapid than this. The steering has a nice element of weighting to it, and though the engine does have a touch of turbo lag at lower RPM, once you get on the move, it's not really an issue. The gearbox is quite nice, a six-speed manual. An auto option was also available, but for the keen driver, this is going to be the one you want. The pedals are all sort of medium in terms of weighting, but very good in terms of communication. The brakes in particular, they're quite nice. You can modulate them, maybe a little over-servoed for my liking, but 
they do the job quite well. It is in these conditions also where the all-wheel drive is definitely showing its advantage because I know for a fact there will be a lot of front-wheel drive cars out there, not just a Mini, that would now be struggling. This though seems to have almost no trouble whatsoever in getting the power down. And once you eventually do find the limits of grip, which even today is relatively difficult, the car simply transitions into very predictable and manageable understeer. This is a really good chassis. The car is entirely standard, exhaust included, and at low RPM, when you lift off, if you're in sport mode, as I am now, you get just a little bit of burble on the overarm, which I quite like. Though it may still look fairly chunky, in reality it's not that big a car, and so placing it is fairly easy. It helps that you've got a pretty good view of that bonnet, and <laughs> it's really amazing how quickly it'll go into a corner. A couple of occasions it's actually taken me by surprise, and yet still there are moments where I think the steering might be a bit too quick for the chassis, but it grips, it copes. I'm impressed. It's even passed the banana test. For some reason I don't really understand, this car has two bananas on the dash. And when I asked James, he said, why not? They're my G-meters. <laughs> the purple banana is now over there, indicating that I have evidently reached maximum G. And I suppose at some point I'll have to go around a left-hander quickly in order to sort of restore balance to the force. Pulling away at junctions is fairly easy. The clutch on occasion I've had a few issues with. I think the biting point is a, a little higher up than I would expect, but otherwise it's doing okay. The visibility is even pretty good, and it's not often I can say that in a modern car. The B pillar is a good way back, and you have a pair of sunroofs too, which I really like. The one at the front will even open either incrementally or all the way, and I really like that. It does help the cabin feel just a, a little fresher and airier. Also particularly helpful because uh, the poor saps in the back don't have a window that will open full stop. And let's just check if because of that it buffets a bit when you do have the roof open. Yeah, it, it does a little bit. I'm at about 40 mile an hour now, slowing back down to 30, and yeah, you can hear that it wouldn't be the most pleasant. However, I tend to like my sunroofs just cracked open a tiny bit and they just let a nice little bit of fresh air into the cabin. I am slightly perplexed as to why these cracks and pops that, of course, we all know are engineered in, have been engineered in so that when you're driving through town at 20 mile an hour, you get them. But when you're giving it hell for leather on the back roads, it's silent. Not sure what's going on there. For me, the company that actually got it most right was Hyundai, whose i30N, if you have the sport mode on and all that, if you're above like 4,000 RPM and you lift off, then it cracks and pops. The rest of the time, it doesn't. That's the way to do it. In terms of technology and interior layout, the car borrows heavily from the second generation Mini, and it is for that reason the chassis code still has an R at the front, this being the R61. In case you were wondering, R stands for Rover. These leather seats I actually rather like, although they're not quite as supportive as I'd really want them to be. They look like they're quite sculpted, but in practice, they're not. Certainly not for me, anyway. A few more practical concerns. The boot is of a reasonable size, and if you are a fan of the regular Mini, that is a fairly universal criticism. Here, it's a lot better. Your infotainment is exactly as you would find it in just about every other second-generation Mini. In other words, it's a sort of minified version of BMW's iDrive, all controlled by a little stick down here that looks rather silly, but in practice actually works quite well. The cabin also does, I think, a fairly good job of blending the retro with the modern, and I think it's actually one of my favorites. Although, once you have realized the fact Disney clearly paid Minnie a lot of money to put Mickey Mouse in here, you can't unsee that. Nor do I quite understand the logic of this handbrake lever, which goes in my list now including the Honda CRV and Renault Sport Megane for being just needlessly weird. It's also a generally poor piece of design because when you've got it engaged, it basically touches the armrest, so if you're looking for it, it's actually quite hard to see first time round. And below that, you've also got a sunglasses holder, all sort of packed into this small little space. It does work a little bit better than you'd imagine, but there is a lot going on down here.
It is the fact that today this is essentially an orphan model that sort of drew James towards it. He likes more unusual things and the pacemen certainly seem to be that. He wanted a mini, he wanted something bigger, he wanted something sporty and he wanted something a little bit different. This ticked all of the boxes. Having now driven it, annoyingly, I also have to say that actually, in terms of the driving experience, it's probably one of my favourites. It doesn't have the crashy ride you get in some others, but it does have a lot more practicality and yet still retains that fun, keen turn in, that sort of sense of puppy dog excitement from the front end when you come to chuck it in a bend. And it's got a chassis that will cope in all conditions. So frustratingly, the Mini Paceman gets a thumbs up from me, best of all, because not really many people ever understood what they were, you can pick them up for a relatively good price. The model starts at around £5,000 with the top of the line Cooper Works like this, all four late model examples commanding around fifteen grand. You will of course then find plenty of others in between those two points and I'm pretty sure that for about ten to twelve grand you could get yourself something similar to this that if you want a small-ish family car would do the job. To put it another way and I think fairly damningly I am having a lot more fun enjoying driving this than the BMW M135i xDrive that I recently experienced up in Scotland. Oh yep the bananas are back. <laughs> so there we have it that is the Mini Paceman John Cooper Works all four annoyingly good. Thanks to James for bringing it out and as ever thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.